Hi guys! So if you've been watching the channel for a while, you know that I mostly do Wargaming scale figures, stuff like 28mm, maybe a little bit smaller once in a while, but, you know, I have had people ask me about bigger scales too, like 135th scale, 54mm, even 70 or 90mm models. Uh, and you know why or I don't paint those on the channel or if I would paint some on the channel uh, And I actually really enjoy painting those larger scales But I have kind of avoided it here on YouTube just because uh, models like that to do even decently are kind of time-consuming And they can also be kind of hard to film really show what you're doing well uh, And so for that reason I've kind of shied away from them, but you know, I thought maybe Today I try something new, uh, new and totally different. So, you know, I'm gonna give a 54 millimeter model a shot today and see how it goes. Um, this is the model of Goth I'm gonna show you. I have uh, tons and tons of 54 millimeters sort of ancients and Romans. So I picked out one of those. This is a sort of a sort of a I guess an imperial legionary type soldier on guard duty somewhere in the far north. He's by um, Hidalgo Benito models. I'll link to that as always, uh, of course, in the description box if you want to know more about him. This is only really part of him, obviously. He's holding uh, a spear uh, and leaning on a shield, which of course is not included here. Uh, I've just attached to him to my painting base here. Uh, I'll show you, for example, this is uh, what his shield looks like. I think I've got it upside down there. So you can see he kind of was leaning on this. Uh, so obviously, if you haven't guessed already, this is not a video I'm going to be finishing in just one episode. You cannot properly paint a large scale figure and get any sort of good results in a day or even two days or even three days. This is going to be a long term project. So. Uh, if this is not your thing, you probably are going to want to tune out for at least the next several weeks. And it's probably going to be that long, at least. I actually don't even know how long it's going to take me. I'm just going to kind of work on parts and kind of record sort of segments of painting this model and just kind of see how far I get every time. So, yeah, this is going to be an ongoing thing for, for a while, at least. And I'm just going to, you know, talk about... Uh, painting different elements of this model and see how long it takes to get him done for you. Um, so, you know, maybe a few things to note here. Also, uh, my commentary is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to keep it shorter, more limited, because when you're painting big models like this, uh, you're often doing lots of similar steps, very repetitive sorts of things where you're maybe say painting five or six layers of virtually the same color uh, and you know it, it's, it's not necessarily relevant to, 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 to say a lot about every single different thing you're doing. So I'm going to be keeping my commentary a lot more sort of general and sort of just kind of showing you a lot more and saying a lot less which probably some of you will like anyway. <laughs> um, otherwise uh, I do want to talk just a little tiny bit about prep work on a model like this. It's not, in many ways not different from smaller scale stuff. He's been, again, here uh, painted with black Vallejo uh, surface primer, acrylic. Same thing I do on my smaller models, too. Uh, there are some other things that you deal with with these larger scale models that you don't at 28 millimeter. Like, for example, most of them tend to come in a lot more small parts, which you have to put together before you can start painting. And depending on the model, that may be a very straightforward, easy process. And with some, that may be a very time-consuming process where you have to do a lot of filling or maybe even fabricate uh, additional parts yourself. Uh, and that's going to vary a lot by model. This one was not particularly uh, difficult. I didn't want anything uh, too complicated in terms of assembly because I don't enjoy that kind of work, quite honestly. But... Um, I'm also not really going to go into it a lot more here. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that um, sometimes you have to not assemble the whole thing before you start painting just because certain elements may get in the way if you've been able to do a good job. And there's different schools of thought on that. Uh, some people I've seen try to just leave the model in as many parts as possible and really paint every single piece individually and then assemble them later. Uh, I tend to be more of a school of thought where I try to put together as much as I possibly can uh, first and only leave parts off if I absolutely cannot even manage to paint the model at all with those parts attached. So in this case, I left off the 
shield um, and the spear, but they'll be very easy to attach later and, you know, they won't really show, you know, so it's, it's easy to do. But I really, really try to put the model together as much as possible before I start. But I'm not saying that's the only way or the best way, it's just what I prefer to do. Uh, in terms of mounting here too, you see I've got him on a stick just like I have my smaller models. Uh, you can do that. The only thing is these guys are a lot heavier. This is a serious amount of lead here. And just what I usually do, which is a dot of super glue, is not really going to cut it in holding something like this in place. So what I've done for this guy is I've used a small pin vise, which is basically just a little um, sort of clamp with, that holds a drill bit to uh, drill a hole in the bottom of the model's foot. And then I've used a sort of a, a strong uh, brass rod to pin him uh, down onto this pole. And I've added a bit of super glue too, which helps hold it in place. And that is a strong enough sort of thing to keep hold on to him well for painting. But with just a little force or effort, I can easily sort of also twist and twisting. I can kind of still take the model off when I'm done with him and I want to, you know, attach him to his, you know, kind of permanent home. That's not really a big deal. Uh, if you don't want to go through with this, it's often you can just kind of uh, glue the model to its display base because most of these big models come with a display base as sort of a sculpted piece. Uh, you can often just kind of glue them down and uh, then hold on to the display base, but I don't really, that can be awkward. I don't like sort of that sometimes holding on to that sort of big flat surface. Uh, it'll, it's really going to just depend on, you know, what you find comfortable here, how you like to work, you know, what you end up doing in order to sort of hold on to your larger scale models. And at 54, this is manageable, of course, pretty manageable. But of course, if you're doing something like at 70 or 90 millimeters, one of the really big models, uh, you, this may not really cut it as a way to hold your model. You may uh, have to really... Uh, you know, break the model into pieces or just do something else to make painting it actually <laughs> a practical option. So anyway, um, I'm going to be starting out today working on the skin, so the face and the hands. Uh, that's, as you see on my smaller models, that's where I pretty much start regardless of scale because I think it's the most kind of the most important part of almost any model and I think for me at least it's very um, important for morale to get that done first and to get it done right. Uh, so, you know, that's that's why I begin with it. But I mean, that's a personal preference, of course. But anyway, so yeah, today I'm going to be starting with the face and hands. I'm going to try to get that completely covered uh, in this video that I'm showing here. And depending on uh, how much time I have left, I may start working on some other element as well. But I don't know yet. We'll just have to see how far I get and then, you know, what doesn't get done, you'll be seeing uh, in a video in sort of the coming weeks. So uh, let's get started and see how this goes. Okay, so here are all the paints that I ended up using in uh, kind of part one of this series. Uh, and these include everything that you need to paint his skin, so his face and hands, and also his pants and his tunic. Okay, I'm going to start off by base coating the face and hands here. I'm using Vallejo Brown Sand, uh, which is the same color I use to base coat my smaller models. And in fact, most of the colors I'm going to be using on the skin are exactly what I use on smaller models. They work just fine for 54 millimeter or bigger scales too. You just have to make some adjustments in terms of kind of subtlety and technique. Now I'm going to apply a nice heavy wash of Reichlin Flesh Shade, again exactly what I do on 28mm models. Now this is a little bit different. Uh, after the wash dries, I'm going to go back in and reapply the brown sand here. Uh, normally if I was doing a smaller model, I would already be applying a higher highlight, but again, subtlety is the name of the game, so we're going to be building up a lot more layers, uh, and I want to kind of get that base layer back on top first before I continue with uh, brighter highlights.
My next step is to define all the really deep shadows on the model, like sort of the areas between his fingers, around his eyes, the edge of his helmet, you know, between his lips, so under his nose, that kind of thing. I do this normally on smaller figures using just uh, pure Vallejo black red, but again, to tone things down a bit, to get a more subtle effect, uh, I'm using black red with a bit of uh, the brown sand mixed into it instead, just so we don't have quite such a stark uh, shadow. I'm now gonna apply my first highlight, which is gonna be a mixture of the brown sand and a little bit of Iraqi sand. It's gonna be a pretty subtle step here, as you can see from the brown sand base that I just applied. Uh, and all of the steps, in fact, that we're gonna be applying in the future are going to be really subtle like this. Um, now I'm going to start painting the eyes because I don't want to get too far into the skin highlighting process before doing this because uh, getting the eyes right is really crucial to the figure so it's good to do it early on in the process. I painted the eyeballs in with some Vallejo Deck Tan and then I'm just going to work on getting the eyeballs to look the way I want. I'm using German Camouflage Black Brown here to paint those in and you really it's just a matter of kind of fiddling and messing with the proportion of uh, brown to white to try to get a balance that you find pleasing and also gives a natural looking eye effect. And I then usually like to take a little dab of the white or the off-white in this case at some point and put it sort of in that uh, pupil to, to, so it doesn't look dead and dull-eyed to give it a little bit of a reflection. But I wish I could give you a more like concrete step-by-step -step process for doing this, but it's, 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 it's going to vary a lot and you're probably going to find yourself going back over this uh, multiple times to get uh, a look that you want because you're just going to keep refining this and it's, it's, it's definitely something where I recommend you do it uh, then do something else for a while and then come back and look at it and keep checking your work because you know you may not see that the eyes are bad right away but if you come back later uh, you will so and I'm and in fact throughout this video you're going to see I keep screwing around with the eyes trying to get a, like a little bit of a better look for them in fact, later on, I even end up painting them sort of a gray-blue color, so I don't leave them this dark brown that I'm applying right now. But yeah, so eyes, they're a pain in the butt, uh, but they're necessary, and I recommend that you do them early on in the painting process so, you know, you don't, you know, end up wasting a whole bunch of time on getting them to look good. Now I'm going to go ahead and apply a couple more highlight uh, layers to the flesh. I'm just, again, using that brown sand, Iraqi sand mix, and for each kind of layer I'm just adding in very slightly more of the Iraqi sand and building it up on the model. point I'm going to start working glazes in between my highlight layers just to develop a more realistic kind of varied skin tone. I've taken 
that uh, Vallejo flat red from the introduction, I've mixed it with some glaze medium. So it's, I've got a really, really thin glaze here. You don't, it's an intense red color, so you don't want to put much in your glaze medium. And I'm going to be layering it really thinly. Uh, you can see over select parts of his hands and face, uh, like, you know, his nose, his knuckles, around, his lips, of course, are going to get a lot. And I'm just going to build up layers, his ears, of course. Um, and the idea here is, uh, I'm going to apply layers with this and then I'm going to highlight over the layers and that way you're kind of relying on the paint's transparency and kind of sealing some of that red in between your, your more tan yellow uh, skin highlights. And now I'm going to apply just several more highlight layers, again just by adding more Iraqi sand into my base color and gradually lightening it up. And I'm gonna continue that way all the way up until I hit just pure Iraqi sand. And you'll notice as I work, I'll be periodically stopping, going back in with some of that red glaze and sort of building it up again light, lightly or sometimes more heavily on certain areas, like again, I discussed uh, before. And another reason I need to do that multiple times is because uh, when you mix stuff with glaze medium, the paint or the glaze medium combo tends to dry a lot slower. So on places that, like the lips, for example, where I'm going to want a, a pretty red coloration, uh, I will need to give it some time to dry really before I can apply the next layer to it. So I just continue to work on other areas while that's going on and continue sort of my normal uh, highlighting uh, process. And then, you know, again, if I feel like I'm losing too much red in an area where I want that red, uh, I go ahead and just add some more back in uh, to, just to keep kind of getting that effect and get it, just getting sort of this nice sort of variance of red tones happening. And it's especially, you're going to see especially important on the face, you know, for getting a good look there. Once I've highlighted all the way up to Iraqi sand, I then I'm going to start mixing Vallejo Ivory into the Iraqi sand so that I can get even higher uh, and brighter uh, highlights because I think that looks nice. I don't want to leave the skin too dark here, especially because we're going for sort of a cold weather, cold figure. So you really want to emphasize uh, the, sort of a lighter, paler skin tone. Uh, and of course that whole red in the skin plays a especially important role here as well because you can kind of use on extremities like ears and nose and kind of exaggerate it a little bit to give that sort of effect of uh, not frostbite but just how your skin tends to react to uh, extreme cold weather.
So I'm going to continue highlighting all the way up to pure Vallejo Ivory, which I'm going to use as just a really extreme highlight on a few areas like the tip of his nose, his knuckles, kind of a highlight on his lip, that kind of thing. You want to be real sparing with that brightest color. And then I'm going to finish off with some other glaze effects. I'm going to take a dark blue gray, and by that I mean the one that looks gray and not the one that looks blue, because Vallejo has two paints card called dark blue gray, and one looks blue and one looks gray, and they have a different like code number on them, but they have the same name. I don't understand their logic, so don't ask. But anyway, I'm using the gray one here to add kind of a little bit of stubble, kind of uh, hair effect to his uh, lower, uh, or his upper lip and his chin, and. I am then going to use, again, a color that sounds very similar, blue-gray, which is a uh, by Vallejo again, but it's a, quite a blue color, and I'm going to make a glaze from that as well. And I'm going to apply that also to those same areas, but also uh, sort of around the base of his hands near his wrists. So I'm going to be applying this very thin, subtle blue um, effect there, and that kind of helps emphasize the cold, but you, you do get a little bit of blue in your skin, so it's nice to finish off with some of these just slight color adjustments, I guess. So time for even more confusing paint color names. I'm base coating his pans here with a mixture of the gray looking dark blue gray paint and the blue looking dark blue paint. Yeah, I, as I said, I really don't understand the logic here. But anyway, so that's going to be uh, the base for his trousers. I'm then going to just gradually start highlighting up his trousers. I want to keep them kind of dark, but I'm going to try to be subtle about it. So uh, at first, what I'm going to be doing here is just uh, mixing uh, the blue looking Again, the blue looking dark blue gray, I'm going to be adding more of that into the mix to sort of gradually lighten everything up and make everything sort of more and more uh, blue looking. And I'm just going to continue kind of applying more and more sort of subtle layers, just building them up um, on top of each other until I get all the way up to just pure um, blue looking dark blue gray. And from there, I'm then going to use uh, the Vallejo uh, deck tan to uh, start lightening the, that that blue dark blue gray uh, very subtly uh, and just building up some sort of uh, extra brighter highlights on the pants but again I'm, I'm not going to go too far with that I don't want it to get uh, too light and that's going to make extra sense you'll see in a moment once I start uh, painting his tunic
Now I'm gonna be painting the sleeves of his under tunic here. The base coat I'm using here is basically close to the highest highlight that I applied to the pants, but maybe a little bit lighter. So it's basically gonna be um, Vallejo deck tan with a certain amount of the uh, dark blue gray, the blue variant again, to avoid confusion, mixed in uh, just to uh, give it that blue cast and to help darken it down uh, slightly. I'm gonna be highlighting the sleeves here just by basically adding kind of progressively more uh, deck tan into my uh, mixture that I already started here and just building it up uh, and really focusing on kind of highlighting all the folds and wrinkles in the sleeves. And I'm just gonna keep it nice and subtle and go slowly with my layers. Uh, once uh, I kind of get up to kind of the max I can get with uh, the deck tan and, I, and you have to be careful too you don't want to lose that blue tinge entirely so you probably want to keep making sure you add maybe a little bit of the dark blue gray back in every step just to preserve that but once i get kind of up as high as i can with the deck tan and i can't really get it lighter uh, i'm then going to start uh, mixing just a vallejo white uh, in and using that kind of to keep lightening the color up. Uh, and you may ask why white instead of ivory? Well, the ivory is a bit of a warmer uh, tone and I want this to look really cool. Uh, the highlights on this to be a really cool shade. So that's why I'm using white kind of as my lightening uh, tone here. Now at some point you're probably going to want to 
do a little work to unify the really bright white highlights that you've applied to the sleeves with sort of the darker colors down in the recess. And the easiest way is to make a glaze by mixing the glaze medium with some of the dark blue-gray again. Keep it really thin. You don't want it too heavy so that it makes things too dark and too blue too fast. And then you just want to really lightly kind of build up layers of that. Uh, and especially where there's a transition, you can see between the really light highlights and the darker shadows. You want to use that to help unify everything, to help it blend together better. And maybe if you've got your highlights too white or too bright in some areas and you don't want it that bright, you can go over it really uh, lightly just to tone uh, your whites down a little bit. Okay, so now I've got a confession to make. Uh, I originally thought that he was wearing more pieces of clothing than he was, so he had kind of like an undershirt on with long sleeves and then a tunic over it and then his pants. But I actually realized later on that it was just one piece of clothing, a long sleeve tunic. Uh, so I was gonna paint this originally a different color, which is why I didn't do it before, but then I realized, no, it all needs to be the same as the sleeve, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm gonna go back now and paint the bottom half of his tunic the way I painted the sleeves. Here I'm just base coating it with the same color I used up above, which is again that mixture of the dark blue gray uh, and the deck tan. Uh, and I didn't remember exactly what mix I used before, so I'm just gonna kind of go over it and darken it a little bit and kind of tweak it until I get a shade that's pretty close looking. I'm using the same process here now to highlight the lower half of his tunic that I used on the sleeves. I'm just gonna take my base and sort of gradually add in more and more deck tan, uh, keep building that up in thin transparent layers. And once it gets to the point where I can't really lighten it anymore that way, I'm gonna start uh, mixing in white to lighten my mixture further. And again, I'm gonna keep adding in a little bit of the dark blue gray just to maintain my uh, blue shade. But I'm gonna continue this kind of all the way up into uh, until I hit almost pure white. You can see here a little bit, I'm again uh, utilizing glazes to help blend uh, areas together and that's if anything more important on a surface like this because you've got sort of bigger, smoother flat areas that need to transition uh, into darker areas and you really see that transition better so uh, blending with glazes is going to be way more helpful. Again I'm using a glaze with the dark blue gray in it a little bit to kind of help just smooth areas together that are very dark and kind of next to areas that I want to be a lot lighter.
And here I am applying kind of my final pure white highlight to the bottom half of the tunic. I've got my paint really thin, so it's gonna go on really transparently and I can build up a lot of nice kind of bright highlight layers over top of my blue and get really great contrast, as you can see, between sort of the highs and the lows on this uh, piece of the clothing. And I know it's a little bit redundant to sort of separately show you, you painting the bottom and uh, top half. I think it is still kind of useful because it, the, the types of folds and creases and the, sort of the way the fabric falls is really radically different, I think, between uh, the sleeves and the bottom part of the tunic. So, you know, hopefully you'll kind of see different things and, you know, get a, an idea of like, you know, different uh, techniques that you're going to have to use on uh, the, sort of the different parts of the garment. Okay, so here is where I am after uh, part one of the video. So you can see I've made real good progress on the face and hands and on his tunic and pants. Uh, I'm really happy with where I am so far and I'm really liking especially how the skins turned out. I think that is pretty good. Uh, I was a little concerned because the this is an older figure and the uh, sculpting on the face particularly is a little on the cartoony side uh, and so and I can't really completely conceal that. So. You know, I'm a little dissatisfied with that, but it's, I don't, and on the other hand, I don't really think it's my fault that it looks that way. So, you know, some things you can fix, some things you can't. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a close up too, so you can really see the work on the face. Uh, at a zoom like this, you're gonna see it's pretty uncompromising on the detail, and you can really start to see where you've um, made mistakes in the painting, and it can make you cringe a little bit because you don't necessarily even see some of the problems in your painting with the naked eye. As a matter of fact, I recommend if you want to do a really good job on these larger models, uh, get a, like a really high resolution camera and sort of at different stages, take a picture of your work and look at it, look at the photos of your work. Don't look at it with your eyes, look at the photos because you will, the camera will pick up all kinds of things, little errors and sloppinesses and things. Um, that you will not see with your naked eye. So it can be really, really helpful if you really are aiming for perfection and you wanna get sort of the best out of your model. I'm not sure that I'm gonna go that crazy here, but it is something to keep in mind, a nice tip if you really want to really refine your paint job as much as possible. So uh, if you like this video, uh, share it with your friends, uh, click the like button, and really definitely on comments, in the, in the comment section, let me know what you thought. I really wanna know if you like this series, if you're interested in seeing more, uh, I'm really curious. So yeah, let me know. And of course, uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can, uh, you know, find out when something new is coming out. So uh, that's all for now and I'll see you next time.